On today's show, public charges, EV road tax, and well, what you can do about them. My name is Chris, and welcome to this very special episode of Renewable News. I'm guessing everyone has seen these scary videos of Boston Dynamics robots. Well, in an interesting move, Hyundai Motor Group will acquire a controlling interest in Boston Dynamics, valued at $1.1 billion. Why? Because these robots can not only be controlled to do jobs that might be dangerous for humans to do, but they also operate on their own. So Hyundai will use Boston's learnings for like autonomous robots and vehicles. Now, whilst the nitty gritty of this deal is pretty, it's actually pretty boring. It's like, I think they're gonna get an 80% stake in them. One can only imagine how like both companies will actually leverage each other's respective strengths in manufacturing, logistics and construction and automation. And what that might actually mean for future um, autonomous travel, say in your favorite Hyundai electric vehicle. Yeah, one can only imagine. Speaking of autonomous, check out the Monarch Tractor, an all-electric workhorse which can carry out pre-programmed tasks without a person on board. Seriously. Operators can still control the tractor through, obviously, normal ways, you know, steering wheel, physical gestures, but they can also do it remotely. Yeah, like a bit of an, an RC thingy. Mm, pretty impressive. And, well, it obviously does the usual tractor stuff and uh, they can pre-program it to uh, follow something around, um, pre-program to go along certain pathways because uh, let's face it, um, fields are normally pretty safe places in which for tractors to operate. You know, lack of people, hopefully lack of livestock and they can just let them rip and go. And this, and this I think is kind of amazing in that, well, it's electric. The Monarch tractor offers over 10 hours of operation and takes only four to five hours to recharge via a 220 volt outlet. They didn't say exactly what level that is. I'm gonna guess it's like a level two charger, so maybe seven kilowatts or more. With a three point hitch and lifting capacity of 998 kilograms, the tractor can even be spec to four wheel drive. So, are you thinking what I'm thinking, B1? I am B2, Interstellar. It's happening, it really is. Oh my gosh, the robots are gonna take over. Ah. Master fans rejoice. The all-electric MX-30 will arrive in Australia mid-2021. Yes, zoom, zoom. Now, featuring a 35.5 kilowatt hour battery pack with a 107 kilowatt electric motor, this is hefty, and while well, due to that small battery and large curb weight, will deliver only just a bit over 200 kilometers on one charge. This SUV will excite many Mazda buyers with its like modern design, sustainable materials, and fit and finish we all come to expect of Mazda. But my only wish is that they make it with a bigger battery so that range is not a barrier to adoption. I mean, if you're looking to replace your mid to large SUV for your family, you want it to be easy out to cope with like a road trip without the need to completely fill it up every two hours. Whilst the exact date and pricing are yet to be revealed, I expect this car to come in around about a sixty to seventy thousand dollar price. So again, it's going to be a very hard sell in Australia to our lack of EV incentives and well, disincentives. Okay, Mazda, listen up. This is how you do electric SUVs: the BMW iX, six hundred kilometers of range. That is both awesome, beautiful, lovely, and but. Oh, that grill <laughs> is so ugly. Oh, goodness. Now, BMW hilariously, and well, maybe smartly, actually called themselves out and put like these various comments on screen as to, yeah, just stick with doing conventional cars, why change it, don't do this, so on and so forth. And those comments, I don't know, they're actually around it being electrified or it was around that grill, I'm not very sure. But look, I detailed the, this SUV earlier this year, so you can go check it out in more detail over there. But nonetheless, if you want to actually register your interest now in Australia, you can. You gotta plonk a little bit of cash down. But yeah, go check out BMW's website if this excites you, because, well, this would be another awesome addition to our roads in Australia. 
Jolt Charge is set to create a free EV charging network in Adelaide with 21 free roadside electric vehicle charging spots. How? Well, with thanks to Arena and advertisers, Jolt actually have these fancy looking chargers that display adverts. And so that gets you 15 minutes of free charging time. After that, well, they're going to charge you by kilowatt hour, obviously, but nonetheless, 15 minutes at DC, you know, fast charging rates is going to give you at least about 45 kilometers, if not more, depends how empty your battery is. So this is a great little initiative and being helped by Arena to the tune of a few million dollars and also the South Australian government and also um, Jolt. So good work, well done. Uh, just maybe I might need to say this and a uh, little shout out to my awesome Patreon, Nigel. Guys, go look to uh, Western Australia. They need a lot more DC uh, chargers over there. And Tesla, you need to pick up your game big time because, well, there's, I think, only one one supercharger spot in the whole of WA, and that's a massive part of our country. And, yeah, they need to make, like, some sort of electric superhighway so you can actually traverse this country without doing it slowly. Hmm. For any Aussies who've been holding out on buying a Tesla Model 3 due to like recent upgrades you may have heard about, well, you can now order and be assured that your shiny new EV will have like USB-C slots, wireless charging, improved center console, Chrome delete, but sadly, a smaller frunk and no more included wall charging unit. But nonetheless, this is I think a very good upgrade and something that a lot of previous owners have had to actually buy uh, aftermarket accessories and we'll see one of these for instance <laughs> shameless plug but why not and uh yeah i think nice change by tesla well done and uh yeah put your order in now hang on a second oh, just recently in victoria we finally got out of four to five months worth of lockdown restrictions so instead of like this how about i just be, be, be right back. Hang on a second. Hey, Ash. Yes, Chris. Hey, did you know that McDonald's has just opened its 1,000th store in Australia. No. No, but you know, you know why that's important? Well, because they've actually committed to going 100% renewable powered, and well, for you, and maybe for me, they're getting on board with EV network chargers, and well, they've just set up two 50 kilowatt chargers at the Melton store. That's pretty good, actually. Yeah, yeah, I must agree. Look, this is a great move, and it just makes sense because, look, whilst you're having some food and drink at Macca's, you could be getting your car filled up at the same time. Yeah. Makes and sense, right? McDonald's always have nice toilets and things as well, so it'd be a good break stop. Yeah. I think that every Macca should have one. Absolutely. And look, um, if you live near Melton, let's actually make sure that people are actually using our char charging infrastructure out in the public space. Yeah. Okay, that, that was a lot of fun. Thanks, Ashley. And look, remember, if you are in the market for like a Tesla Model S, X or 3, consider using his referral code. Or if you like, you want to get a power wall, use mine. You get like 1,500 kilometers of free supercharging credits and well, potentially other amazing stuff. Yeah, Tesla, what's happening with those whole sort of raffle things you talked about? Mm, who knows? Now, if you are enjoying the show, look, please do subscribe, give us a comment, or maybe join me over here on Patreon to help support the channel because, yeah, this, this, this takes time, money, and effort. So I really do appreciate that support. Before I get into my last two stories, I want to set them up with some recent policy announcements by Australian politicians. Unfortunately, due to time reasons, I'm not going to do a deep dive today, but with Tim Washington coming up, I think I need to make mention that our buffoons are setting Australia up for failure. Some pollies champion coal mining, coal exports, and coal this and coal that. Gee, I wonder why. 
but many countries around the world are either actively banning imports, phasing out coal power plants, or announce a future that doesn't involve coal. Yet this guy continues to promote it because hashtag Ozpol so corrupt. Then there is my favorite, Angus Taylor. Dude, how are you? You been good? Excellent. Hope you have a good Christmas. Happy New Year. Anywho, he should be actually reducing emissions because that's actually his portfolio. But mind you, he loves gas, gas extraction, fracking, use and exports. But again, many countries have announced fossil fuel bans, phasing out of liquid natural gas. You get the idea. Think UK, Japan, Norway, heck, most of Europe. And well, again, he seems hell-bent on increasing emissions, long-lasting emissions. And then this last one, before we talk about like EV incentives and disincentives, Australia is planning on introducing another tax on motorists of one cent per litre to help us support a, a dying industry. I mean, I really want to swear right now, but I won't because again, hashtag YouTube ad friendly. A lot of hashtags today. But these fossil fuel companies in Australia already get $27 billion in subsidies. 27 billion, remember that number, okay? And well, this new tax will be an additional $2 billion per year. Imagine how many solar, wind, hydro farms, whatever <laughs> farms you want to put there, maybe EV charging infrastructure, green hydrogen power plants, so that you can actually do exports. And well, already our renewable economy has more than 30,000 jobs in Australia, 10,000 are in fossil fuels. Yes, they're going away. This is increasing. You get the idea? Do you get, do you get the idea? Do you see where this is going? These, these guys just get me so angry. So I find it truly frustrating and absolutely disappointing that they're setting up this terrible future for our kids, your kids, our families. And I just, it's now, and I don't like to get political, but it's now that we really need to actively let them know that we're not happy we, we know that they can do better and they need to actually ignore the uh, this and start doing this, okay, true action. I mean, goodness sake, just this last day or two days ago, the UK announced that it was going to stop supporting fossil fuel companies. Imagine $27 billion on a lot of different things. Heck, our health, we spend more than $18 billion just on the effects from exhaust pipes. You, you could save $18 billion if you shift to electric vehicle transport because you can get your power from wind and solar. Things that don't pollute, things that keep the lungs clean. And, oh, man. EV Networks, an ultra-fast charging network provider in Australia, has dropped its time-based charging for use of its 50 kilowatt and 350 kilowatt chargers. Now, they're moving like to 40 cents per kilowatt hour for the 50 kilowatt chargers and 60 cents per kilowatt hour for the ultra rapid services. Now, for those at home, you may be balking at these prices saying something like, I pay 15 cents per kilowatt hour. There is no way I'm paying for that. Or maybe you're this guy. Tell him he's dreaming. For the times when you're out and about, you'll need to pony up for this new charge, which will cost like a test amount of three standard range plus about well, $30 to fill its battery. For a car that uses petrol, that'll be around about, well, five litres per 100 k's. So you're kind of getting close to internal combustion engine costs here, yeah? So I think this is still a fair price, especially when you consider that they used to charge 35 cents per kilowatt hour consumed, and well, 25 cents per minute on top of that is on the one hand great, because especially if like you've got a car that can rapidly charge, so you're not charging very long at a charger. Conversely, if you've got a car that charges very slow, you're going to be penalised because you're going to be sitting there for a long time. So I think this time-based method is actually a very welcome move indeed. But this I didn't know until Dr. Sully uncovered some really shocking pricing stuff going on in Australia. EV charging companies like ChargeFox, Tesla and more EV networks don't pay for electricity like you and I do. No, they pay on like a variable rate that, di that is dictated by market forces and a demand charge. So check this tweet out. 
If five cars charge 60 kilowatt hours each day, every day, for 30 days, then the true cost of EV is about 88 cents per kilowatt hour. That's insane, right? Basically, $53 per charging session. And those who do use like the public rapid charging system are paying like only $30. So these companies are essentially losing about $23 per session. And well, that's not including like site costs, leases, charging hardware, maintenance, uh, all the upkeep that goes around actually having one of these charging sites. So to explain more, let me call in a friend, one of the founders of Jet Charge and Charge Fox, and well, chair of the EV Council, Tim Washington. Hang on. Hey Tim, thanks for joining me. Hey, good to see you. Hey, good, good. Long time no see. Absolutely. Very yeah, cool. Hey, look, I've just been talking about um, look, the EV network and the recent changes. Uh, and look, I, I appreciate you don't need to speak about the business and things like that. But the thing that baffles me and that I don't understand is the um, demand charges. Can you explain it to me? Yeah, absolutely. So um, for those um, who aren't aware, uh, your electricity bill, especially in commercial sites and industrial sites, is made up of several components. Demand charges is this idea that you don't only pay for what flows through the pipe, mm -hmm. um, which is your energy, but you also pay for how big the pipe is, which is the demand. And depending on which state you're in, what tariff you're on, uh, which network provider you're with, it's mm -hmm. this whole myriad of options. Um, but consistently for commercial and kind of larger, more energy intensive sites, uh -huh. demand charges do apply. Okay. Because the network say that it costs them to provide you with that, the size of that pipe, okay. and you should pay for that size. Wow, crikey. So I'll, I'll come to that point in a second then. If I was like a, a fish and chip shop or a Macca's, who I think are yeah. high, high electricity users, would they be on this as well? Depending on the tariff that they're on, again, it's one of those things that's like, you don't understand this until you start looking at it, but there are so many tariffs around Australia, but some of those, yes, they will be on that. Right. The key difference I would say though, is that they are using most of the time a consistent amount of energy. Uh -huh. So what that means is that they smear those demand charges across each kilowatt hour. The reason demand charges are such a big issue for EV charging infrastructure businesses yeah. is that usage at the moment is still very low. Yeah. And because we don't have many EVs on the road, yep. which basically means that the demand charge per kilowatt hour, well, I mean, demand charges are levied on per kilowatt, yep. but when you look at it per kilowatt hour, all the energy that you've kind of put out there, yep. the costs are really, really high because we don't have high utilization. So right. unlike traditional shops, or if you think about like an aluminium smelter, we yep. actually use a lot of electricity all the time. Yep. The cost per kilowatt hour is not as bad. But for EV charging infrastructure businesses, it's far worse. Wow, crikey, that's fascinating. And so just to return to your point you said before around the amount of power that they provide to you, that is to say, you know, the, the, the pipe width, as I like to describe it. <laughs> yes, sure. Um, but I, I, as I understand it, though, you guys are responsible for the infrastructure installation, right? So, you know, building the, the line from whatever point that they deem you should join to, that you need to actually make that big fat cable to your transformers and your capacitors and things like that. Is that right? Yeah. So the way it normally works is that when we apply for a site, um, a lot of the time we will require our own kind of on site, we call it distribution transformer. Right. Mm -hmm. And so that's a, that's a service that the network provider um, gives us. Right. So they basically say, yep, you need a distribution transformer. And here is how much we charge you for it. Right. Um, and it may, be, it may be very little or it may be the full amount, depending on how much money they think they can make um, from you over the, over the lifetime of that distribution transformer. But often we have to pay quite a bit, yeah. but they still own that infrastructure. Oh. Well, what they're charging you for is not so much that particular box. Yeah. The rationale for charging you is essentially they look at the network or their patch as a whole yeah. Um, and they say that that's why it's they need to charge you for demand charges. Yeah. It has to reflect what they call cost reflective. It has to be cost reflective. Yeah. Um, and so they argue it is cost reflective and there are kind of certain people within the EV industry who are saying, 
that it's not cost reflective. Yeah. Um, so we're having this argy bargy now. I will point out that like, you know, we're not the only people arguing about demand charges, but in this very early stage of EV adoption with really low utilization, yeah. Um, it, it, it does hurt EV charging infrastructure businesses who yeah. were trying to establish fast charging infrastructure for everyone. Yeah, no, definitely. And um, the, that's uh, another thing they've been harping on about um, in recent times, probably the last two years, in that, you know, there's been recent ra- ramblings around, uh, well, Victoria and South Australia in particular, bringing um, EV road uses taxes. And, you know, like, uh, uh, can you share some thoughts on that for us? Yeah, so look, this is something um, that has been really disappointing for industry. And um, I, I, will, I will point out, and I always do point out when I talk about the road user charge, mm. that the, both the South Australian and the Victorian governments have publicly announced um, funding for EV charging infrastructure. Yeah. Right? And we have in the past been supported by the Victorian government for EV charging infrastructure. So I think like credit where credit is due, right? So we need to give them credit for that. But they think that that will offset the negative impact of the road user charge, Mm -hmm. which I respectfully say to them, thank you for, you know, putting your money into EV charging infrastructure, but it doesn't work if there are no EVs on the road. Mm. And unfortunately, when someone is purchasing an electric vehicle, they'll go, okay, well, there's more EV charging infrastructure, but... I have to pay an additional 500 bucks per year. Hmm. They're not going to buy that EV in the first place. Yeah, and so what the government has done is that they've actually reduced the impact of their own investment in EV charger infrastructure <laughs> because there will be less utilization. Yeah. Um, and so if there is going to be a net negative benefit, uh, sorry, net negative impact, then we don't support that. Yeah. And I think, look, to be very honest with you, there are a myriad of reasons why they're doing this. Um, and there's a reason why they're coordinate. all the treasurers are coordinating to do this. But um, I, I don't think they've consulted widely enough with industry to understand the full impact of what they're saying. Mm-hmm. Because in their heads, they think all EV drivers are just rich, you know, Tesla owners or Porsche owners or Audi owners or whatever, right? Yeah, yeah. They don't fully appreciate the impact that this will have on fleets, yeah. And therefore, they don't fully appreciate the impact they will have on a vibrant second-hand market for electric vehicles. Yeah. Um, just as we're starting to see more affordable EVs hit the market, just as we're starting to see, I guess, more affordable, well-maintained government fleet second-hand EVs hit the market, mm-hmm. the people who may have bought those EVs, who are not rich, you mm. know, who often are stretching to get an electric car, who yeah. want to do the right thing by the environment, they're mm. penalised for that. Yeah. Um, and I think if they consulted more widely among both users and industry groups, they would have heard these stories and they would have said, okay, well, this is not for us. Yeah. And I think that's the reason why, you know, despite that this was coordinated between all the treasurers for a long period of time, 12 months, yeah. when South Australia announced and Victoria announced, you saw other states come out and say, well, we're not actually going to pursue this, mm, mm. Um, even though it's kind of been in planning because they started listening to some of the feedback that they got and they go, oh, we didn't actually realise that, you know, mm. this had wider impacts. And I think they've done the right thing and said, all right, well, let's consult more with industry. Let's consult more with users mm. and go, you know, will this discourage you from buying an EV? Because yes. if you're going to buy like a Taycan, Porsche Taycan, yeah. no, I don't think it will discourage you from buying that. But they're not the people we're talking about. No, exactly. You know, so... Yeah, yeah, it's absolutely. disappointing. It's very disappointing. Look, just in conversation I've had in the last few weeks, uh, several people have indicated to me that they are now no longer looking to buy an EV because of these very reasons. And um, the, as I understand it, uh, like 50% of new car sales are fleet sales. And so two, three years downstream, right. when the end of lease it, it comes to an end, those 70,000, um, you know, Konas and uh, Model 3s then become secondhand and affordable, affordable. That's right. <laughs> Whatever that is. Well, I mean, they, they do become more, I guess, affordable because most of the depreciation the kind of has been taken out of it. Yeah. And what really kills me is that the people who are purchasing these secondhand EVs are likely people who drive longer distances mm-hmm. because those who are on lower social economic incomes benefit the most from the low running costs and maintenance costs of EVs mm-hmm. and they tend to live further out, but yeah. they will get slugged the most 
because yeah. of the road user charge. And, you know, in Victoria, the system that they're proposing is one where you self-report kilometres at registration, yeah. which is, you know, the, I guess the simplest and dumbest way to implement it, but it doesn't allow for any kind of means testing uh, when it comes to usage. Yeah. We should be, like, trying to help people gain access to lower cost and low emissions transport. Yeah. What we're doing is the opposite. Yeah. Okay. Um, and it's just, it, it, for, for I, I would say in Victoria, a very progressive Labor government, this is something that I think has blindsided a lot of people. Yeah. And I think for that reason, actually, the, the, the feedback, the, the backlash has been more than they anticipated because, you know, it's not only that they're doing this, but people can't believe that it's a Labor government who's doing this, who's been mm. very supportive of environmental initiatives. Yeah. Um, and but we're still hoping to, you know, the EV Council. We're still hoping to come to the table with the Victorian government, and we're still hoping to kind of um, come to some kind of resolution for that. Beautiful, awesome. Well, thanks for the comments around that. And um, I guess did you did you have a suggestion for around, you know, uh, particularly for like charging companies like you guys, you know, with um, you know Charge Fox and so forth? Is, is there a business model that you that you could see working? Um, better for you? Is there a business model that would work better for us? I mean, yeah. Chargebox is a little bit different to the other charging companies um, mm -hmm. We in Australia. So yes. we have um, partnerships with vehicle manufacturers yeah. um, and we also operate quite an extensive network um, from a software perspective. Yeah. And so we're a little, we're a little bit different. So we, we don't really make money from the sale of electricity. I, I, I think I think my suggestion would be if there's anyone looking to come into this and, you know, there are other companies like Jolt Charge who are looking to offset um, electricity yeah. costs through advertising mm -hmm. similar to Volta in the U S yeah. um, making money from the sale of electricity is really bloody tough. Yeah. Like it is tough. Yeah. And the, the only thing you need to know about that is that existing petrol station companies and their downstream retail assets already have problems making any margin to speak of from the sale of fuel yeah. from petrol. And that is an established resource that costs about four times as much as electricity. Yeah. So, so if you're a charging company who wants to make money purely from the sale of electricity, it's going to be really difficult because they already can't do it with petrol. Yeah. It's going to be harder to do with electricity. Plus you're competing against home charging, workplace charging, all of that. Right. Yeah. And so it is up to each charging company to find their own sweet spot. Yeah. Um, but I would say that, you know, you probably need to have some alternative forms of income as well. Sure. Okay. <laughs> all right. Well, look, all the best and thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate right. it. Yeah, good. All right. Stay well. Thanks. Cheers. All right. Well, thank you for your time, Tim. And look, he's hoping for some better policies and more fair pricing in this great country of ours. All right, well, that wraps up another short and sweet episode, and I do hope you've enjoyed it. Look, if you want to find out more about uh, the EV road use tax thing, um, check out this video I did up here a few weeks ago. And otherwise, do, do get onto your local member. Um, let it be known, tell politicians that, well, you know, if you want to raise taxes, maybe look somewhere else just for the moment, because, well, yeah. EVs will have to pay the way. They're using roads just like everyone else. But I think right now, with about 6,000 or so car EVs in Australia, this is just a pathetic attempt to try to equalize the playing field, where in actual fact, it is not equal and it is not fair. So yeah, do get onto your local member, please. All right, so wrapping it up, if you haven't already, smash that like button, subscribe, give us a comment, join me over here on Patreon, but otherwise, you be good and you be great.